Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship. Uh, you have found a nice, cool place to come away. Welcome to all those who are gathering uh, via online worship. We pray God's blessing as you come into this place that the Lord's presence will be that refreshing breeze to, to cool your spirit and to remind you that you are God's child. We will be celebrating communion today, so I just want to give a very quick word of instruction. I'll try to do that again, perhaps, as we come to communion, just because we always forget. Uh, you will remain in your seats as Peter and myself bring out uh, individual wafers, which will be in a cup, and we invite you to reach forward and to take one of those cups for yourself and to receive the wafer from it. Uh, Peter will offer the tray, which will have pre-poured grape juice and pre-poured wine. The grape juice is darker, but it's labeled, so we hope that uh, you can receive in which kind you would like. Uh, and again, after you have received that, I will have a garbage bag, and I invite you to just place both in that, and then we will proceed forward and uh, all are welcome at the Lord's table to receive God's grace and God's goodness. We prepare ourselves to come to that table by opening ourselves up to God's presence through confession. So I invite you to take a moment to prepare your heart for worship, and we will gather with a brief order for confession and forgiveness. Family of God, we gather for worship today as we live our lives in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, so that we might perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Brothers and sisters, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us that sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's God's great invitation. Let's claim it as we come to God in confession. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. <laughs> Family of God, I invite you to receive the good news. Scripture tells us, who is there who can condemn us? Only the Lord. And the Lord gave his life for us. So in him there is no condemnation. Enter into that fully. Because we know, in the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sin, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us rejoice in this good news. It sets our tongues and hearts free to sing, better is one day.
family of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us give heart and voice attention to God's prayer for today as you find our prayer of the day on the PowerPoint. I invite you to take a moment to read through the words so that they're in your heart as we give them to God with our lips. <coughs> Let us pray. Almighty and merciful God, we implore you to hear the prayers of your people. Be our strong defense against all harm and danger, that we may live and grow in faith and hope through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. We now give heart and attention to the first of God's readings for today. Our first lesson is taken from Paul's second letter to the church in Corinth, the eighth chapter. Paul writes, now, as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in utmost eagerness, and in our love for you, so we want you to excel also in this generous undertaking. I do not say this as a command, but I am testing the genuineness of your love against the earnestness of others. For you know the generous act of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor so that by his poverty you might become rich. And in this matter I am giving my advice. It is appropriate for you, who began last year, not only to do something, but even to desire to do something. Now finish doing it, so that your eagerness may be matched by completing it according to your means. For if the eagerness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. I do not mean that there should be relief for others and pressure on you, but it is a question of a fair balance between your present abundance and their need, so that their abundance may be for your need, in order that there may be a fair balance. As it is written, the one who had much did not have too much, and the one who had little did not have too little. The word of the Lord. Amen. Thanks be to God. a second here ready here. I know we don't have any children actually present with us uh, this morning, but uh, I know there's some tuned in uh, via the internet, so this could be a, just a real gong show. We're going to see how she goes here. Yeah, it's already starting to talk. Well, good morning to all of you present today and to all of those who are able to tune in via the internet. We are so thankful that we have opportunities to be in worship and for the last 16, 15 months we've been able to be present to God in so very many ways uh, and I'm thankful that you have been reaching out to the Lord in so very many ways uh, and uh, so some of you young people, um, you know, probably you don't find yourself in a whole lot of need for a string these days. Uh, sometimes maybe uh, you want to remember something, so you need a little piece of string. I don't know if kids, you still do that, tie a string around your finger to remember. Maybe you get a little older. You need to be careful where I'm looking. Uh, I should look at myself. Sometimes you need that, but every now and then you just need a little bit of string. And so you know what? Uh, fortunately, I've got a little bit of a little bit of a, a I don't know something happening with my robe here today. It's coming apart. So you know I can just reach over here and I can grab myself a little piece of string and. Whatever I might need that for, I can tie it up, uh, a little string around my finger, but sometimes maybe I need a little more. Uh, and so thankfully, there's still a little bit of string sticking out of my shirt here, my, uh, my alb, so I can cut that off and, and uh, maybe I can, I don't know, that's almost long enough I could tie a present or something with that, but uh, you know, maybe I still need more. Well, you know, if you get a hold of a string and you tug it, Sometimes, I wouldn't really recommend doing this too, too much, but you can, uh, you can get a good piece of string to come unraveling off of your clothing there. And moms and dads, talk to your kids about whether they really should do this and come to you maybe first and foremost. But uh, yeah, you need to go a little bit longer. Maybe it's just not going to do it. So you've got to pull a little harder and you've got to reach and you've got to get a, get a good tug on it there and you can get a real good piece of string there. And oh my goodness, the things you can do with that piece of string. Well, you know what? In our gospel reading today, I'm going to encourage you to really listen to this because you're going to hear about a woman who had a real deep need. It wasn't for string, but she saw Jesus and she thought, if I can just touch his robe, maybe, 
Maybe out of that, something can begin to happen inside of me, and I can become more whole. I can become healed. What she discovered was that she, when she reached out and just touched even just the slightest bit of Jesus, she gets everything that she needs. No shortage, no cutting off of little pieces bit by bit, but his full presence to bring the real deep healing that she needed. It's the same for us. We never have to doubt that we can reach out and Jesus won't respond to us. The Lord is present each and every day with the fullness of his love, the fullness of his grace. And I encourage you, as uh, many of you kids are going into summer holidays and there's going to be lots of good things happening in your life, but there's going to be times when you're going to feel alone, you're going to feel struggling, hurt, whatever it can be. Remember that woman who reached out and through Jesus received what was really needed for her. Keep doing that so that maybe you don't pull too many threads out of your clothing. Let's bow our heads and let's come to God in prayer around that. Holy God, we give you thanks for this day and the opportunity to be here in your presence, to receive your word in your presence through the Spirit. And so God, help us. You know our lives. You know the things that cause us to stumble, the things that make us feel cut off, the ways we feel alone. Remind us to reach out to you in prayer and scripture and worship through uh, brothers and sisters around us. You gift us in so many ways with your presence. So help us to trust and to know and then to receive in the reaching out your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Family, I'm going to invite you to rise. Let's join together in our gospel acclamation as we sing, You are my all in all. Jesus fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly, My little daughter, 
is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. So Jesus went with him, and a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for twelve years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had. She was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak, for she said, If I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately her hemorrhage stopped, and she felt in her body that she was healed of the disease. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? His disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you. How can you say, Who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him and told him the whole truth. Jesus said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. When he had entered, he said to them, Why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then he put them all outside, and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him, and went in to where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Halitha kum, which means, little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about. She was twelve years of age. As this, at this, they were overcome with amazement. Jesus strictly ordered them that no one should know this, and told them to give her something to eat. The Gospel of our Lord. We praise to you, O Christ. I invite the community to be seated. Friends in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Well, some of you uh, will know and remember that I like the comic strips, I like movies, there's a few different things I like to spend a little bit of my time on. I'm sure you, that's not all I ever read or do with my time, but uh, I don't know if you're familiar with a, a comic strip called Shoe. It's been in the paper sometimes, it's, a, it's an older one, maybe, maybe not one of the, the big ones that you're familiar with, it's about a group of birds, I won't give you all the background to it, uh, but they work in the newspaper industry and there's a bunch of other birds, they're kind of like people. Well in one of the strips there's a bird named the Professor, and he's always kind of shabbily dressed, this tweed jacket that's way too big for him, and his glasses, and he always looks a little disheveled, uh, and in this comic strip he's, he's at home. And he's thinking about just how wonderful it is to be single, living the single life. Oh, it's so good. He's thinking to myself, anytime I want the remote control, I've got it in control in my hand. I don't have to worry about battling for it or what to watch. Or I don't have to get all dressed up for dinner. I can, uh, no dress code in my house. Or I can eat right over the sink. Oh, the single life is great. And then in the next frame, he's sitting in the easy chair, with remote control in one hand and a bag of chips in the other. And he's saying to himself, it's too bad there's nobody here to see just how happy I am without it. <laughs> Sometimes, maybe we think that sounds pretty attractive. Be there for everybody at a distance. Just live for myself. Don't have to worry about the rest of the world. Don't get involved. I don't pay too much attention to what's going on with other people's lives. And just kind of really focus on myself. Walk away if I have to. Just go into that shell. And I'll admit, sometimes that does sound kind of attractive. Life is hard. I'm not saying anything that's particularly brilliant when I say that. You know that. Each one of you in your own life has experienced that and may be experiencing that right now. Some hardship. Some difficulty. But we have a Savior who didn't walk that way. Who didn't say, I'm just going to live for myself. I'm just going to make sure I'm on my path and I'm just going to be self-focused and make sure I do the things that are mine to do. 
Jesus takes the time. And then he says, you look to me as the way. I am the way to the Father. I provide that for you. That is part of my mission, ministry, and my activity in this world. But you are people of the way. And you are called also to be engaged, not only in your own life, but in the life of the world around you. And we have this gospel reading. And it's, uh, to me, in so many ways, a challenging one, but also an astonishing one, perhaps, in some respects, for, for the Christian community, for the church to receive it. Uh, and I'm just going to very quickly try to recap it. I know you heard it, but sometimes there's a lot, and it goes past it's really, really quick. Uh, and, and commentators call this a sandwich. Maybe this will help with the drill into your head. They call it a sandwich passage. Because there's one event that happens at the beginning, and then there's another event in the middle, and then that event continues on underneath, right? You can visualize it almost as a bit of a sandwich, right? And Jesus is he's in his mission, he's in his ministry, he's teaching, he's healing, he's proclaiming the kingdom of God, and the crowds are coming to him, and people are starting to know that in this one there is something new. There is something that is possible for me and perhaps for the community as well. And so this religious leader, Jairus, comes and seeks him out. And Jairus is undoubtedly somebody who everybody looks up to. He's respected. He's a family man. People will look at him and say, wow, that guy is blessed. He's got everything going for him. All things are well for Jairus. Until tragedy hits. Until pain comes into his life. Until loss comes upon him. And in that pain, he seeks for someone who can possibly bring healing to him. And we've got this woman. She's the complete opposite of Jairus. Certainly in that culture, and sometimes it's hard to really get our head around the culture uh, of 2,000 years ago in Palestine. She's a woman. One check against her already. She has this ailment. For 12 years, she has wrestled with this physical issue, this hemorrhage. We don't know exactly what that means, but it meant that there's some flow of blood that uh, physicians have not been able to stop. And in their culture and in their faith, as they understand it, that makes her unclean. She's hardly a person. She is outside and unacceptable to God. Keep her off at the margins. Don't let her anywhere near. If you get too close to her, there's the chance you might touch her, or she touch you, and then you are unclean. You are unacceptable before God, if she were even to touch the hem of your robe. Both Jairus and this woman are in pain. They're suffering. Sometimes the word we use for that is grief. How are you with grief? I think our country is experiencing grief. Certainly many in our nation are. You know of what I speak. Muslim community, suffering, hatred, violent attack. Our First Nations, brothers and sisters, and they have much ahead of them, don't they? And I don't know about you, but I, I, get, I get choked up and I begin to think that it's the community that bears our Savior's name, that partnered willingly and readily in this because they saw on those people those who were unacceptable. Those who were uncared for by their Creator. And they pushed them to the margins and they did it far, far worse than that. And so there is grief around us and within us. But grief is normal. It's not something we want. I certainly don't care for it. And, and uh, I'm a Norwegian Swede English. Oh my goodness. So you want to talk about having troubles with emotions? It's bred in my bone, and, and maybe you have some of that as well, but grief is as normal as falling asleep at night. It is as normal as sneezing when your nose itches. It is how God made us, so that we understand there is a part of me that is not right, that hurts. And grief takes time. As a community of faith, we have to ensure that we give our brothers and sisters, our cousins, those around us time to work through what they are suffering, first and foremost. That we offer acceptance to what they speak, to what they have to bring forward, and that's hard. Because we can come up, oh, you know, the, the oldest game in the book is Pascabach. You know, what about? They call it, what about-ism. 
that as soon as somebody perhaps lifts any kind of charge that maybe has some kind of purchase on my life, immediately I'm pointing the buck. And if you don't think it's the oldest game, go and read Genesis. And what happens when Adam and Eve break God's law? First thing, Adam was, well, it wasn't me, it was Eve. And, and Eve, first thing, well, it wasn't me, it was a snake, right? The snake had not a leg to stand on. So it's, it's, I'm sorry, that's a bad joke, though, right? How quickly we want to just deny. We want to say, it wasn't me. I had nothing to do with that. But one of the tenets of faith that we hold to is that by the work of the Holy Spirit, we belong to the Holy Catholic Church, small c, which means the universal church of all times. That we can certainly hold all the good that the church has done, and we are pretty quick to say, look at what the church has done, and there's much we can. But we also bear some of the weight and responsibility for what the church has not done, or what it did, which was not in keeping with our Savior's purpose. Healthy grief allows time and acceptance for the other to work through it. And it also honors the past. If you walk through your own grief, whatever that may be, the loss of a loved one, I know some of you have sometimes said that the older you live, the more you seem to lose. And then sometimes that's people, sometimes that's freedoms, mobility, so many very different things. There are a lot of ways grief comes to us. But we have to look to the past and honor it. And say, that is a part of my life. And find the right way to frame it so that we can be grounded in this present with a possibility for the future. I know you've got to get your head around that thought, right? Honor the past so that you can live in the future with possibility for the, sorry, live in the present with possibility for the future. Go watch the video, you know, live straight afterwards. But that's, again, what some of our people and family around us are working through. We have to hear the past. We have to go to those fields, those grounds. We have to go there with our cousins and weep and listen and honor that so that together we can move forward because that's what healthy grief also wants to try to do, to bring a healing that enables you to be compassionate, to understand what it is to suffer, but to have that suffer transformed so that you can be with somebody else who may be suffering and help them along the way that they may experience transformation as well. This is hard stuff. We can't do it alone. But we have one who is acquainted with suffering, who enters into every pain and loss and can transform it, and who will work in us to be those partners of transformation as well in whatever way we may be able to offer. Is it to catch that in our reading? Jesus, in the midst of a massive crowd, all the things that are going on, the distractions, the noises, the celebrations, the, the worries, all these things, he recognizes one person's touch, and he stops. He doesn't say, I'll keep going on, or that's no big deal, or, oh, but I think that person got healed, right? I've got something to be going on. He stops. Jesus knows when we reach out, and Jesus will not leave us until we have experienced his touch, the wholeness that he brings when we place ourselves in his hands. And he calls her daughter. Daughter. You have taken the first step. The healing is yours. Continue in that path. He goes into Jairus' house, and, and in all of these things, again, it's hard to get our head around this notion of unclean. We hear it so much in the Bible, but it means completely cut off from God is the sense of it. And by the touch of that bleeding woman, Jesus is now unclean in their eyes and in their understanding. And he's going to go in and he's going to touch a corpse, which will make him doubly unclean. And he does not hesitate. But he goes into that place of loss, and into that place of sorrow. And there's this, this, this moment where there's people weeping. And you know, you think at a funeral, of course, there's going to be people weeping. But in that culture, you would hire people. If you were a person of the community, if you were a person of uh, some wealth or some ability, you hire people who would wail and, and weep on your behalf. And Jesus sees that piety and that, and that fakeness in a sense. And he says, you get out. I just want the family. I just want the people who are right here now suffering. And he takes them, and he brings life out of death. And he says, little child, get up. Jesus honors their humanity. In every case, he declares, you are a child of God. You are not some category. You are not just some way of being thought about that helps keep you at a distance. You are a daughter. You are a child. You are a son. You are a brother or a sister. Get up. And live. And 
woven into this story. Boy, sometimes you really got to sit with a with a reading for a while to try and unpack everything. And, and I have the advantage of having some additional time when I'm not reading comics or watching movies. I do read scripture and commentaries. And the number 12, which is a very significant number in scripture, it is a symbolic number of Israel, of the nation. And there's a woman with a hemorrhage for 12 years. And there's a child who is 12 years old. And so we are take note that something is happening here and it has something to do with the nation that Jesus has come to proclaim a new day and that there is no one on the margins in his kingdom there is no one who is unclean before the Lord in his eyes there is no one who is an outcast or less than human when Jesus is present and that that is the purpose of that nation and I believe in I would even say that that is God's purpose for any nation that they are to look to those who are downtrodden, those who are pushed off to the sides, those who are hurting, those who are suffering, and to find ways to try and work healing for them. So the days and the weeks and months that are going to lie ahead in years, it takes time to work through grief. We will pray. And I encourage us to go deeper than that. Prayer is powerful and important. But as a congregation, I hope we will strive to find ways to be open to the community around us. We move into opening up our, our church. We call it opening up again. Well, it's not just for the inclusive, right? It's not just for the ones who got their name on the membership rolls. This is for the world. And we will strive to find ways to be agents of healing. And perhaps one of the big ones for us, and I encourage us to try and do a little research, and I will do some research too as we move forward, is to get well-versed in the truth and reconciliation uh, findings and what they put out <clears throat> calls to action they call it and I think we have I have I confess I have not walked closely enough with that as sometimes in this place we have cousins from the First Nations who come and come to know me I guess a little bit more and who come reaching out for some form of help who reach out to touch the road through this community of faith looking for something it is important to know where they have come from and how can we listen and strive to bring or offer some level of healing? Because the astonishing thing of the work of God is that when we think we're offering healing to somebody else, it is God bringing healing to us, changing our heart, transforming us into children of God. Let us walk in that light, and may God make it so. Amen. In his time, thanks be to God, his time continues to be at work in the world. Let us rise. Let us proclaim it together in song as we sing our hymn of the day, In His Time.
are in our Lord's hands and we rejoice in that and we seek to live out our time in his way as he guides us we do so by faith therefore we are bold to confess that faith as we use the words of the Apostles Creed let us join together I believe in God the Father Almighty creator of heaven and earth I believe in Jesus Christ his only son our Lord he was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary he suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Family, I would invite you to be seated as we turn to God in prayer. I invite you to let your heart be still. And let your spirit be open. To know that God is present here and in the world. And that God accepts us when we reach out to God. Great and holy God, you are the source of our life and all life. Your glory and majesty is true, is beyond comprehension. Your majesty is infinite. We praise you. And we should praise you each and every day. We marvel at your love. It is more than we can comprehend. That it is there for us. That it is there for this world. We pray for your church. The body of Christ throughout the world. You know the ways in which we have failed. You know the ways in which we have harmed. You know the ways in which we have blessed. And you know the ways in which we have striven. We pray that you take all these things and continue to move us forward into your future. Bless our leaders, pastors, council members, Christians, and people of faith everywhere. Open our hearts to the way of Jesus Christ, and then help us to follow each and every day. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy God, we ask and pray that you would extend prosperity and uh, equity to all people. Open our hearts with generosity. Your servant, St. Paul, wrote that wherever uh, the heart is open, the gift is acceptable. And you have blessed us. This is a good creation that will provide for all people and all life. Show us that, and then help us to be good stewards over that. We pray for our national leaders, our provincial leaders, our civic leaders. Grant them wisdom. Give them caring hearts above all other things. Help them to strive to make decisions and policies that will serve the welfare and well-being of all things. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, we pray for our community of faith that we call Trinity. We seek to live our lives in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We pray that all that we do, all that we say, and all that we are would bear that shape, that we would be citizens of your kingdom living for you, shining your light. Draw people to us, we pray. And when you do that, help us to be welcoming and open and loving. And when we fall, forgive us. May we also be centered around confession and reconciliation, knowing that that is the path of healing. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, you are the Lord of peace and the bringer of healing. You know our needs. You know the people, the situations we carry inside ourselves, sometimes afraid to bring them into the light. Maybe we feel we can't even tell those closest to us. But we can tell you. You will always stop. And you will abide by us until the healing begins to grow. So now we offer to you the cries of our hearts, the blessings we are receiving, Everything that we have, we turn over to you and ask that you would bless in the ways you know are best, as we name them, silently or aloud.
roll before you those from within our community who are shut in or are struggling with health or other concerns in life. Brad Kuniger and Faye Kroc, Dorothy Bornstrom and Edna Matthews, John Dempty, Ron Polson and Marlene Polson, Pat Enright, Shirley Bemsoven, Richard Gerling, Audrey Hedlund, J.C. Cardinal, Amy Langhorn, Ruth Grills, Bart Kishner. Make your presence known to them and give them your strength. We pray for those who work the land, for the seed that has been planted. We pray for favorable weather. We pray that you would bring the growth so that in the harvest we would see your goodness. For graduates and students and teachers as they come to the end of another school year, we rejoice in the learning that has happened or the ways it has been able to happen during the coronavirus. We pray for those who work to bring an end to that, grant wisdom and insight, new discoveries and opportunities to share. We know there are many in this world who are impoverished and who don't have that easy access to vaccinations. We pray that you work in the hearts of nations to find ways to share from that abundance. Lord, we pray for wisdom. Often we are quite convinced we're doing the right thing, that what we are doing is going to be good for somebody else. Help us to sometimes check ourselves, to pause, certainly to listen to the other, to discover if that is truly what might be needful. Out of your abundance, God, you have given us your Son, Jesus Christ. Though he was rich for our sakes and for the sake of the world, he became poor, so that by his poverty we might become rich unto eternal life. We pray that all those who dwell in you, those who cry out to you, would know healing and empowerment and might be set free from those things that bind them. Help us to all work forward to your future, which you have declared to us in your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Family of God, I invite you to rise for the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Holy Father, through Christ our Lord, who rose beyond the bounds of death, and just as he had promised, poured out your spirit of life and power upon the chosen disciples. At this, the whole earth exults in boundless joy, and so together with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Brothers and sisters, we remember that on the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples to eat, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, Drink this, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Family of God, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Come, for all is ready. I invite the community to be seated. As Peter and I set ourselves, I will remind that we will bring forth the bread and the wine and the grape juice to you. I ask that you would take the cup with the wafer, as well as the cup with the wine or grape juice, and once you have received, I will have a bag that you can place your empties into.
congregation, please rise. And now, may the body and blood of our precious Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, strengthen us and keep us unto eternal life. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, you gave your Son both as a sacrifice for sin and as a model of a godly life. We ask that you would enable us to receive him always with thanksgiving and to conform our lives to his through the same Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now, family of God, I invite you to enter into the blessing. May the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord make his face to shine upon us and be gracious to us. May the Lord look upon us with favor and give us peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now I would invite the community to be seated. And uh, we have a couple of announcements. Uh, you may be getting tired of them because they're sort of the same ones that keep coming around and around. Uh, but certainly you've been receiving my letter, I hope, as well as some communiques from our council regarding some repairs to our roof. We're so very thankful as a community of faith for the stewardship that we have that we have received from those who went before us and that we are receiving now from those around us. Uh, we're about halfway up to the goal that the council set of $40,000. I think we're just a shade underneath that. Uh, we know other gifting had come in even before they set that 40000 so we pray that uh, you are blessed in your giving. As you give through the church, uh, we pray that this church will be a blessing to the community uh, and that uh, the roof will be sound. So uh, we're very blessed that it's well on its way. Thank you for your giving. Uh, the other one I will lift up is summer worship. Uh, I will be taking off for a little bit of holiday time in my next letter. I'll, I'll uh, lay that out, but a couple weeks in July, a couple weeks uh, in August. Uh, In-person worship will continue. Council, there, I'll let you know, this coming Wednesday, and please pray over this, uh, our synod, our provincial church, will be holding a Zoom meeting with representation from all congregations about reopening. Our government's ready to reopen. They've declared July the 11th as uh, the day that all bets are off. And you can start doing all kinds of stuff, I guess. And we give thanks that we're moving towards that. The church wants to figure out how do we proceed. Uh, we want to do it properly, safely. Uh, and so after the Synod has had this meeting and perhaps laid out some potential paths, our council will begin to uh, determine how we will start the reopening process regarding things like distancing, uh, coffee hour, masking, right, uh, sitting where we tell you, all those kind of things. So we're going to try to figure out how to lay that out and more information will come out in, in the weeks ahead. So thank you to those who will also take on that task uh, and uh, try to figure out how to do it safe. And uh, we celebrate. With those who will celebrate for anniversaries, I have Joe and Debbie Hulak, and our birthdays are George Hind, it's today, Skylar Jones later this week, Peter Salikin also later this week, Gislaine, uh, Simonania next uh, coming week, and Debbie Moore. And uh, to our visitors, God bless you today. We, uh, we are thankful for your presence, and we pray that you are blessed in your week that rides ahead. Let's join together wishing those who celebrate a birthday a happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear friends. May Jesus bless you. Let's rise and we conclude our time of worship our sending him joy, joy, joyful, joyful, the one who sings. Help the cloud. 
worship is concluded. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen.